So speaking about the truth and nothing but the truth and why type systems are important to configuration management. And I, here at Public Conf, you are going to get a lot of very hands-on practical advice. So I'm going to not do that so much and stay a bit more on the philosophical side in this talk. So here's some uh, contact uh, details about me. And as Britt said, I'm, I'm the person to blame for the Puppet Forex language and the type system. All right, so starting with a very important question here. What is truth? Do we know truth when we see it? I hope you can read this ad from 1882 by Dr. Batty. And Dr. Batty, he's selling asthma cigarettes. Um, and Dr. Batty, he might have been on a mission from, from God, having a divine insight that, yes, asthma cigarettes is the thing to do. Or he may have believed that they actually work. Or he may have believed that there are enough fools out there to make, make himself rich in the process of selling these. Or he may be, maybe he was fooled by someone else. I don't know if you can notice at the very bottom there, it says, not recommended to children under the age of six. So maybe Dr. Batty, after all, did conduct a scientific double-blind study <laughs> where he concluded that a child age five smoking one of these asthma cigarettes will see as little benefit as sitting next to a chicken. Actually, the asthma cigarettes, they didn't contain nicotine. They contained atropine. And um, atropine is really, really bad for you if you uh, overdose. And it has very bad uh, side effects. The idea here uh, of inhaling smoke to, uh, to be beneficial to your lungs is actually a very, very old ancient belief that problems of the lungs comes from being cold. And the idea is that if you inhale smoke, which is warm, it will be beneficial to you. In reality, or in fact, the asthma cigarettes, because of the atropine, they did have an effect on the symptoms of asthma, but at the, at the same time, being absolutely horrendous to inhale because any form of smoke inhaled by the asthmatic is not good. So what was true here? So truth and philosophy, and different kinds of truth. Starting from, from the left here, we have the notion of some kind of divine truth, where the will of God has been written down in scripture, and it, it is the absolute truth, because God has said so. For instance, in, in, in the Bible, we could read in the book of Kings that if you jeer at a bald man, you will be torn to pieces by bears. So of course, Everything that's in scripture is divine truth and absolute truth. When dealing with truth, um, we have the concept of coherence of belief. That is, we form our beliefs of what is true by judging it in comparison to what we already believe to be true. And this is irrespective of how we derive at the, uh, the axioms of what we believe are true, the, the statements that are, goes unchallenged. And thus we build up our uh, belief system of what we believe is true. If it's founded on divine truth, uh, then of course we cannot ever jeer at a bald man and everything that is being said about a bald man or a bear will be uh, related to that truth. Um, it could be based on scientific, um, on science, or it's based on uh, any community or folklore that we buy into. Changing that is, of course, difficult, as these are all uh, intertwined. Another form of truth is the logical truth, symbolized here by Aristoteles, uh, the old Greek philosopher, who, um, to boil down or <laughs> condense what he said uh, into one sentence. 
his, his, his sentence is really that no one can believe that the same thing can and at the same time not be. So it, something cannot both exist, not exist, be true and false at the same time. And these, this Aristotelian uh, logic uh, is what Boolean logic is founded on, which we find in programming languages. It's either true or false. We can do operations on them like not an and, an or, and things like that. And all that reasoning comes from uh, the Greek philosophers and uh, Chinese and Indian philosophers before them. Lastly, uh, science or scientific truth, um, where be uh, our belief is based on independently repeatable observations of reality and where the beliefs are challenged. So we can say that scientific truth, that is a statement of probability proportional to the evidence. And we will change over time as evidence change. And that is what we feed back into the coherence of belief plus like Aristotel Aristotelian uh, logic. Also interesting in relation to this is the post-modernistic thinking is that reality cannot be known, only beliefs. And this, this was formulated by the philosopher Immanuel Kant in his Critique of Pure Reason which, paraphrased, it goes like this. Our knowledge of a table is as opaque from reality as is love. It is in our brain, but we cannot understand it. Now, I, I, you know, that's very, very, very fussy. We, we cannot really know what's out there. Uh, we perceive it, and we believe something about it, and it's all in our, in our head. Um, but it's really hard to observe our own thinking and understand how we think. And this last bit, we do not understand it, I find very, very interesting. And what is that? What is that mystery? And we'll come back to that. All right, so if we're gonna deal with truth, we have to also be able to um, find what is definitely not true, distortions of truth because two half-truths that does not make something true. So we have things like pseudoscience. When you take science and apply that to something that's not scientific, or just pure nonsense, like astrology and alchem alchemy, medical quackery, and, and the occult. Here symbolized by Dr. Dr. Scott's electric flesh brush which George A. Scott started selling in 1882 and made a lot of money on. And it was claimed to cure rheumatism, diseases of the blood, malaria, a dozen other serious uh, conditions, and last but not least, toothache. And this device was in fact magnetic, and that was the whole thing. Um, but George Scott liked to sell things that were electric, so he, he said they, that they were and he was um, awarded several US patents for his inventions, and they were sold uh, a lot. He sold a lot of them in the late 1800s. This is just like bad science. So we want to remove bad science from uh, our, our reasoning and our systems. We have ambiguities. That is, lack of context, lack of definition, or simply clashing definitions. So we don't want those in our reasoning, but they are a good source of puns. Don't make me explain that. Right. And last, what is most interesting here are paradoxes. The first sentence here is what, what often is referred to as Epimenides' paradox. He, he didn't actually say this, but what he said means this, and that this sentence is false. So what's interesting here is that this sentence seems to be both true and false at the same time. And in our minds, when we look at these sentences, they first look true, then they look false, then they look true again, and then we flip back and forth until we kind of take a step back and we say, oh, this is a paradox. Now the, the notion of this, uh, oh, sorry. Um, there is one paradox called the preface paradox. Someone uh, named David Makenson uh, introduced this in 1965. 
and it goes like this. When you're writing a book and you're publishing this book, you believe that book to be free of error. You have painstakingly proofread the entire book. Other people have proofread the book. And when you're ready to publish it, you believe that it is error free. Yet, you include a preface. And in that preface, you say something like, the errors that are found herein are mine and mine alone. And by doing so, we can clearly hold the idea in our mind that something is true and not true at the same time, thus contradicting Aristoteles. Now, what's going on here is I, I, I'm really fascinated by this. And there's a mathematician called Gödel, and he showed that any system um, cannot prove the truth or falsehood of every formula in itself. Instead, we need somehow to escape the system to another level where we can then explain or prove the falsehood or uh, truth of uh, one, one of the system's uh, formulas. Where naturally then, the phenom phenomenon of paradox repeats itself infinitely. It's like pointing a video camera at the screen showing the image from the camera. And you can't really escape this no matter what you do. If you try to film the camera, film, filming the screen, you, <laughs> you just add levels of kind of metaness to, to the whole thing. So maybe this strange loop is the true-false quantum chaos flipping around. And maybe this is what we do not understand that Immanuel Kant was telling us about, our brain. We cannot think outside the box that is our mind. So questions here, is there an end to the recursion? Is that God or quantum mechanics looking back at us? We should get some good pot and really figure this out once and for all. <laughs> Now, this, this notion of escaping to the higher level, uh, this is the best I could come up with to illustrate the escape to a higher level. Clearly, the first uh, sentence here, if you add the second one, saying a sentenc is a kind of English sentence where the word three means four, and error is a white space. All other words are English. Now you can prove if, if the first sentence is true or false. I don't know if you got the time to actually register how that paradox works, but that's one of my favorites. Because it has so many paradoxes going on at the same time. This sentence contains three errors. What's a sentence? Is that a sentence misspelled? So there you have like a true false. Is it talking about itself or is it talking about something that's called a sentence that we know nothing about? And then it contains three errors, errors. Is error an error? And so forth. And it, it flips back and for, forth on so many, many levels. All the things I've said so far, uh, I've used English words to um, illustrate things because um, we use words to communicate. Words in a language. So communication is based on language. And language is a shared understanding of syntax and semantics. It's built out of the words or the symbols we use. Or words are symbols, are in fact symbols. And symbols are abstractions for things, real things, either inside of us like emotions or real tangible things out there in the world. I don't know if we have any Japanese speaking or reading persons in the audience. Um, if so, you you know what that means, but to the rest of us, that simply carries no meaning. It's, it's just a symbol. Now, if I tell you that this symbol is love in Japanese, all of a sudden, it's communicating with us. It's carrying meaning. So let's carry out an uh, experiment here. Uh, I'm gonna show you a picture, and I want you, when you see that picture, to shout out what it is you see, the first thing you think about. All right, are you ready? One, two, three. K. 
cow, right? Actually, this isn't a cow. It's a plush puppet. Oh, it's a picture of a plush uh, Muppet kind of cow projected on a screen. It's not a cow at all. But it's an abstraction of a cow. Just like the word cow is an abstraction. So cow is a pattern that we apply to something we perceive, and we then have the abstraction cow in this case. And in this case, the plush animal happened to match that pattern in all your minds, so you were able to say cow. So how were we able to do that? Well, we trained our neural network since we were very small. And we expanded that pattern. We trained it with different uh, occurrences of something that could possibly be a cow. And then our neural network has expanded. So it, it then has the capability of recognizing something as a cow. When my kids were small, I found it really fascinating uh, how they could, uh, you were out walking around or in the park, and they saw a dog, and they go, dog, or doggy, and dog, and doggy. And then one day, suddenly, they point at a dog, and they go, meow. And, and it was like, oh my god, you were doing so well. <laughs> how could this happen? But that is actually the training of the neural network. They're build, kids are building up their network by pointing at things, either saying what it is, or trying to figure out where the edges are. Are dogs things that are saying meow, or is meow a quality of something else? A cat, of course. So these abstractions that we form and hold in our mind, they are this, this kind of fluid, glowing kind of thing. And the more abstract, the, the, more, the more of a glow it is around something, it, the, the, the harder it is to um, get a grip of what it actually is. And of course now, do just like Tina Turner wonder what love's got to do with it. It's such a secondhand emotion. Now the point I'm trying to make here is that human language is, is filled with ambiguities and paradoxes. And sometimes uh, the meaning we're trying to communicate requires a lot of words. And sometimes there's a single very well-defined word that is precise. And sometimes we misunderstand. If we translate this to uh, reason here to <laughs> configuration management, we don't want our servers to ponder over paradoxes. And little do we care if they appreciate art or puns. We want to describe our configurations, and we want them to be made so that they are predictably, so that they predictably produce the desired outcome. Or if we change that, what we really want to know is my puppet logic error free. We can always run our puppet logic to see what happens, but clearly we don't want to make mistakes in our logic that if we happen to run that in production, would destroy every server, turn our, uh, you know, it into a, a, a pumpkin, pumpkin patch of useless servers. Clearly, we do not want to find in testing what we could have found out while we were authoring the logic. Also, when we author logic that, are, that is to be consumed by others, we want to help them to use what we provided without ambiguity. We want clarity, no bad science. Uh, that's out, completely out. As humans, we can communicate with the fuzzy logic, the, the, the sort of thing you find in uh, like Monty Python, the Monty Python, Python nudge, nudge, know what I mean sketch. I don't know if you've, if you've seen that, but yeah, some, some hands were going off. That wouldn't work in a, in, a, in a CM system at all. You can't say like nudge, nudge, hint, hint, do the right thing, do what I mean, hey, hey. Uh, although sometimes I, I wonder if we don't have features like that in, in, in Puppet. <laughs> this relates to also when, when reading source code, reviewing source code, um, where we, ho we hold beliefs in, in our mind how things work, and when we read something, we interpret it, we, we add meaning to what we're reading. 
and it's really hard to find the problems because we project into it what we want it to be, what we intended it to be, and we think that therefore it's true. But our wetware up here is not definitely the best machine to assert if in instructions to our CM uh, system software is actually correct. So how do we deal with problems of truth, if we like? Um, like provability, uh, correctness. Uh, well, we can certainly constrain the space to what really matters. We can cheat. We can be sloppy, ambiguous, or use bad math and rely on folklore to prevent accidents. Maybe we're, we were just ignorant. We didn't know how to solve the problem. Maybe it was we didn't have enough time, or maybe we thought it worked another way. And then there's folklore. Don't go off into the woods. There are evil spirits that will devour your soul. Stay on, on this safe path. And if you do, the system works. Should we add more rigor to the system? We added a lot of rigor to Puppet 4. Of course, it was a bit of an ordeal for those struggling to uh, migrate from 3 to 4. But from everyone I've heard that have migrated, they are so happy over the added strictness uh, in the language. And when I ask if they think it's too much, they say on the contrary, they want more. They want Puppet to become even more strict and help them even more to tell them if there are problems and tell, uh, tell as early as possible that uh, something is wrong. So that's what we want to do. We want to provide features users can build robust solutions on and provide reasoning in around based on good specifications. So dealing with a system that is not founded, not built on solid ground. I was looking for illustrations like the, the wacky little kid smoking next to the chicken. But I stumbled over something else that I, I thought was a very good illustration. This is from Twitter, where uh, tag Gossip Girl Twitters, Microsoft Word, moves an image one millimeter to the left. All text and images shift. Four new pages appear in the distance. Sirens. <laughs> All right. Unfortunately, this kind of haiku, although it's not in haiku form, um, sadly sometimes reminds me <laughs> of, of uh, Puppet. We have things like that in, in Puppet. We used to have a lot more of them. Now in Puppet 4, they're gone. There's still things to deal with. Much more to fix. Here we have DevOps engineer Jim using dynamic scoping and some resource overrides based on automatic tagging. I'm going to throw yet another term into the mix here. Deus ex machina. Maybe you've heard about heard this term. God arrives via machinery. This was used by the old Greeks and um, in Greek drama. Um, when they had a problem in the play, when they couldn't continue the plot because it wasn't logical anymore, they had to escape to another level. And what they did was that they had a machinery like this where uh, they entered a god into the play, flew in from the air, and the god arrived, zapped the mortals, killed them, and set the stage right, and then the play ended. So god arrived via machinery. So where, we do, where do we have things like that in Puppet? Where is the god uh, descending upon us? And I, I have a couple of examples. All right, so it looks simple. At the bottom there, we have class C inherits from B, and B inherits from A, and class A doesn't inherit from anything. Here the god, god comes down, arrives via machinery, and tells us error, one level only. So the implementers here decided that, eh, you can have class inheritance, but only one level. Uh, we don't know how to deal with this problem. Uh, we, we, we can't have a, a round earth here. We, we better make the earth pl flat because we don't know what will happen if you travel a, the whole you know, lap around the earth and come back or whatever. This is infinite. Ooh, that's scary. Let's chop it off here. On the other hand, it might have been a good decision because inheritance in, in Puppet is not like inheritance in, 
in uh, other languages, so I don't know. Another a, a very different way of where the god comes in and saps us is through a sort of infinite regression. We have the type system, and I'll talk more about the type system in just a minute. Here we have the we type 42 type, and if you do that, uh, Papa will print out, or if you notice that, it will notice uh, that that is in fact an integer. So what is the type of integer? So if you ask integer what is its type is, you will get type integer. And if you type that, it will say type type integer, and so forth. And you can repeat this until you run out of machine resources. So that's one way the, the god enters onto our stage and, 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 and zaps us. So why we, did we do this? Why didn't we cut it off, cut it off at level one or so? Well, clearly level one is really practical to have, and so is level two, which, which is you can reason about types. The third level, yeah, that's, that's, that's also reasonable. But at type type integer, does that have any practical value? No, not so much. But implementation-wise, it's much easier to just let this regression happen if someone indeed were to point the video camera at the screen. You would get the infinite loop. And, and it will amuse you for a little while, but it will have no practical value. You can actually solve such infinite regressions. Um, here's, here's an example. This is valid puppet code. Uh, it's a function that computes all the successors to a number. And I'm sure you can spot the flaw immediately, and that is you will run out of resources if you try to compute this because you'll blow the stack because it is, in, in fact, an infinite recursion. Now, if the here the god comes in and smacks us, but we could have made a much smarter implementation that actually recognized this and said, ah, this is an infinite recursion of all numbers being the successor of a number. And the system could understand that and represent that with another symbol that wouldn't take an infinite amount of resources to compute. Now, we chose not to do that because Puppet isn't Mathematica. So we constrained the problem and said that is not something that you're using Puppet to do, um, uh, computing number theory. Uh, it, it's not just something we do. So endless recursion. So Puppet type system. Type is a kind of pattern. So type is simply a pattern that allows the system to recognize a value as matching that pattern. That is, to make an abstraction out of what is being observed. Abstraction of a cow over there, obviously. So the pattern matching is like what a regexp is to a string, only that we attach a name to that regexp. The main difference is that the type has a pattern that is not solely uh, possible to apply to a string, but actually to any value. Works just like the word cow associated with the neural network that we have in our minds to recognize something as a cow. Oops. So types, types make it possible for us to write more succinct and robust code. Just like precise words makes communication more efficient. How would you communicate cow to someone if that word did not exist along with its synonyms? You would need to use a lot of words to communicate that. So here are some values of different types. So we have the name string, which is a type, which is a pattern that is a sequence of characters. So th those values would be strings. Then we have numbers, so all those values are numbers. Some of those values are integers. And of course there's you know, float for floating point. 
our types are parameterized, so we can describe in more detail um, what we mean with this pattern. So if we, if we were to write integer 5, 7, it means all the values being from 5 to 7 inclusive. So it would match 5, and had we had a 6, it would naturally also match that. We can use enum and enumeration, and we can say an enum of red, green, and blue matches those strings that are red, green, and blue. We can create new words, new types, by just saying type color equals enum red, green, and blue. It matches exactly the same thing. So then we can just use the word color to describe that. And we can use color then as a first class data type, just like all the others. We have powerful types like the variant type in Puppet. A variant of color and integer would, let's say if you wanted to describe a named color like red, green, and blue, or a color expressed in uh, RGB values, like an integer, you can type that as variant color or integer. And in, among these values, it would match the, the ones circled. So the type system is rich. It has, of course, like the concrete data types, integer floats, and strings, and booleans, and what have you. And um, for, for structures such as array and hash. But it also has more uh, interesting types like tuple and struct that allows you to provide more details about arrays and, and hashes. We have some new types being introduced uh, quite recently in, in Puppet 4 series. For instance, the sensitive type, which is used to mark as this is data you should not leak. We support uh, Semver and Semver range types, so you can do calculations on versions much more easily than you could before. We support time, uh, like a measure of time, uh, uh, time span, or a point in time, a timestamp with operations on them, so you can do arithmetic on them, and many more. It would take too long to explain all the details of all the types, so I'm not going to do that. Yeah, so you could create your own. We saw an example of uh, defining what color is. This is really powerful. It's just not, it's more than just a simple alias. You can define recursive structures. So the type integer tree, that is, it's an integer, an array of integers, uh, or in that array, you have, could have arrays containing arrays of integers nested to any depth, and you can express that like this. So types are, are namespaced, and they are auto-loaded. So you can define your types in your module that you want to use. And in the 4x Ruby function API, you can have additional local types, which helps to define the signatures of functions. Then types can be used in many ways in uh, the Puppet language. For instance, first we have a definition of a function, my, my func. We have typed the parameter x to be of type my type. And also, a recent addition to Puppet is that we can specify the return type of a function. Here, the function is specified to return boolean. What happens is that when you call the function, Puppet will automatically assert that the given values match the type that are declared. And if, if it doesn't, it will report a type mismatch error and point out where that mismatch is. Then as the function returns, it will check if the return value matches the type that was specified as the return type. That is great to be able to specify the return type for several reasons. Um, what if the, the, the implementation of the function is faulty and you are relying on it to return a particular value? That value may escape out into, to your manifest and it will end up in some attribute of some resource somewhere, causing some strange effect to happen, much 
uh, far from the place where the actual mistake was made inside of the function. So it's good to be to declare this and protect yourself from mistakes. In define subclasses, we can also use types um, for the parameters. They don't have a return value, uh, so you, you cannot specify that. On lambdas, you can also uh, type the parameters, and you can type the return of the lambda as well, if you like to. A lot of the time, that's not necessary, because it would be overtyping. If you already know or have asserted the type of something, like it's an array of integers, then you don't have to, again, assert that if you iterate over it, that it is indeed an integer. You can trust the system to not have uh, um, modified the type of the values that you have asserted. Since the type is a pattern, it was logical to use the pattern matching operator to match a value against a type, just as you can match a string against a regular expression. So dollar value matches my type will be true if value is an instance of that type or matches. And we can use that in case expressions as well. So if you have a value and it's valid that it is of different types, you can just do a case on the various types that it might be and then therefore have a, a nice branch out to the exact logic that you want to happen for, for that case, which is far better than having like an if-then-else uh, kind of spaghetti where, where you're checking if it is this or, or not. So highly recommended to use. There's also an assert type function, uh, and the assert type function does what, it, what its name implies. It asserts that the value is indeed matching that type. And if it is, it returns the value. If it isn't, it will uh, um, raise a uh, type mismatch error and describe what the problem is. So that's very condensed what you can do with the type system. When you're thinking about a type, uh, a type system, the, the first thing you probably think about is, um, is, this, is, is this about a, a, a programming language that is strongly versus weakly typed or statically versus dynamically typed? And actually, th there's no such thing as being just one or the other. It's more of a scale from, from str a very strongly typed language where there's no implicit conversion at all of any data type, even if it's completely harmless. You have to uh, completely type everything everywhere, otherwise the compiler will say, no, 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 can't do that. Or to a language that performs some conversions, but not all, to a system that has the notion of type inference, which I will show you what it is in, in a slide or so. Or it's a system that doesn't really have a type system. It doesn't, you know, it's eh. I'll blow up later if, if you told me something that's wrong. So strongly or weakly typed are kind of fussy uh, concepts. Um, the notion of a type system was introduced um, because when we were all programming in assembler and there weren't all any high level languages, the problems were that instructions were tied to data types and it was difficult to pair up the actual data type with the instructions. And if you made something wrong, you could like store a 16-bit integer value into an 8-bit slot, and then causing memory problems, overwriting values, and all that. So data types were introduced to allow a compiler to generate the code for us, the assembler instructions, doing the right thing, because we told it what the type is. So we used types to have memory protection. Although we didn't, like in a language like C, didn't have any real memory protection because you can always typecast to whatever you like and then overwrite memory and uh, cause catastrophes. Now, if you compare that towards something that has, also has type inference, so the system can figure out what the type is and therefore make decisions on that, and you don't have to uh, specify the type. It can still be strongly typed. So you get all the benefits of, 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 of the system uh, knowing what's going on. 
a type system's uh, strength is really measured on what it can do over and beyond like the basic core data types like integers and floats and strings and, and, and stuff. So for instance, like the union type, you saw it, we have it in Puppet, it's a variant. It's either one type or the other. It could be a type like an intersection type, which we don't have in Puppet, at least not yet, which is if you're given two types like the integer range minus 128, two plus 127, and then you intersect that with the integer zero to 255, values that would match both of those types would match integer zero to one, two, two, seven. I don't know how valuable that would be to have in Puppet, but uh, still, it, it's a powerful thing. There's also something that is called existential types, which is basically a type that says has interface. Uh, it's very similar to duck typing, but the interface is given a name. Go has, the, the Go language has this. And a little bit, we have, sort of have it in Puppet because you can do, do uh, this with tuples and structs, for instance. What's really powerful is dependent types. And that is the ability to capture uh, qualities of the values that you are matching against, assigning those qualities to variables that you can then use in the rest of uh, the definition of the type signature, say, of a function. So here we have a function called shorten that shortens the array by one element. And if you give it an ar array of any type, the result is an array of the same type where the elements have the same type, but it's one element shorter. Now we have assigned a lot more meaning to what this function does. And having powerful constructs like this, if you take this even further, uh, let's say that this was not an array, but it was a tuple where each and every element is typed. This shorten could say, well, is it shortening from the beginning or the end? What, are, what is the content of, 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 of this data element as it's returned from this function? Then we can give um, the type checking system even more powers to, to uh, tell us if our program is true or not. not. And finally, we have something like duck typing in Ruby and, and JavaScript is, is, hey, yeah, maybe it works. Uh, try it and we'll see. When we have a strong type system, it is like having two programs in one. We have one, the concrete level, which when we run that, we, we observe what it's doing by running it. And then we have another program sort of overlaid that defines the program's meaning. So finally, uh, type inference. How do you do type inference? Um, a type inference is a static transformation of the program to uh, type equations that you then solve. And when you do this, you can statically then find known to be impossible operations. So here's an example. If we take one plus one and we do type inference, we would compute the type of one, then add the type of one to that. That would mean be integer plus integer. And we can say, yes, that's allowed. And the result of that operation is another integer. We can do that with variables. X dollar X equals 10 means we do the type inference type, the type of dollar X is in fact a type of 10. And we get the same result, integer plus integer, which is correct. And then the final example, when we do that and we assign a regular expression uh, to um, the variable dollar $x, uh, we end up with integer plus regex, which is clearly illegal. So that's type inference in a nutshell. We do have type inference in Puppet, and that is what the, what the type match operator is using. And you can see that in action because there is a function called uh, type. So if you note this value type from that array one hello three comma 14, it will print out in exact detail what the type of that is. And you can ask for type reduction and type generalizations to arrive at an array of scalars because scalar is the common type for all those types of length three 
or if you generalize it, it's an array of scalar. It's not specific to, to a length at all. So, to wrap this up, code clean, type strongly, and you are creating a reinforcing loop of truth in your logic that we can build on as we're adding features that will provide you more provability, security, and information about the truth in your system. So do type your inputs, do not overtype. Test because it's not perfect. We don't have all the powers uh, of, of a, the most advanced type system that will take a very long time to do and fail as early as possible. Thank you. <laughs>